back to episode three of season two of Deposit That Podcast. Before we do any introduction, I do an intro song. So let's hear the intro song. Stand up when I move, you move. Just like that. When I move, you move. Just like so Chris Tarda from EXP. Now I see you have a new brand called Move. Is it Move with Chris Tarda? Yeah, basically Move with Tarda Properties. Yeah. But before we get into that, first we want to wish you a very happy birthday. I know it is your birthday today. I asked if it was thirty-five. You said it was forty-two. <laughs> yeah, man. What a way to start this off, and man. <laughs> what you wouldn't believe is I actually opened up the corporation, the LLC, for deposit that on one thirteen last year. Oh, good. So out of here. it's a kind of a joint birthday party, and happy you know we you. can't uh, have a guest without bringing special treats. So we actually have four. Why so jelly donuts? Um, I was not offered one, in case you were wondering. Um, I was actually not even allowed to eat one, but I'll give you one. You can have no, one. they're for you and your kids. They're for you and no, your kids. Yeah, but what sense. we are going to do is open these bad boys up and take a look. So make sure everyone goes and follows Why So Jelly Donuts on Instagram. Um, these are some badass donuts. You know, I luckily get them for free, which is why I put a little bit of a belly on. But if you can see these right here. These these donuts are ridiculous. I've had a few. I put them out of my open houses. Look at those bad oh, look at boys. This. This is custom made. Custom made. You got a birthday cake, a red velvet with cannoli filling. Looks like an I don't know an Oreo like style Something, donut. Yeah, Oreo. You and got a chocolate classic, with sprinkles. sprinkles. So oh, man, I'm gonna take these home. Thank so you why so, so much. So Jelly Donuts is gonna make you deposit that all, all right. four of those. You got it. I'm gonna take these home. I'll share them with my my daughters, and this is super exciting. Thank so you. So now much. let's get right to the crux of what we're here for. We're here to talk a lot about real estate today, right? How to manage your business, how to be accountable, how to be an agent. You know, growing a team. But most importantly, I think we should talk about today. Officially, Zillow became a real estate brokerage in New Jersey. What are your thoughts on that? Um, we knew it was coming. We, we enabled it as realtors, unfortunately, uh, the MLSs, and it was kind of like the old, um, you know, the, the, the drug dealer, uh, um, you know, similarity because we gave them everything. We gave them everything. We gave them the, the keys to the kingdom. They used it. They used it to sell the information back to us, and we keep buying it, you know? So it's definitely something that uh, we knew was coming, and here we are. So we got to deal with it. So now, wh what do we do moving forward, right? Obviously, there are you know people that aren't going to be able to succeed now because Zillow has the data. Now what? Um, Zillow has all the data. We don't have it. We don't. Ian, I hear ourselves playing in the headphones. For those watching, sorry for the technical difficulties. There we go. I still I hear, hear it late, lately. Yeah. We're real estate guys. We're not tech guys. In case anyone's watching, <laughs> this is not our forte. Listen, I don't handle what I don't know how to yeah, handle. Yeah, that is for either, sure, man. <laughs> it's still because I'm not. I'm not hearing it on my end. Okay, we, that's fine. Uh, I hear it now. I don't hear anything. Okay, which is all right. So, okay, so we gave them the ki the keys to the castle, if you will. Now Zillow comes and says, "Okay, Chris, yeah, great. Now you were the featured listing agent. Now they're going to be running their own IDX feed." into Zillow. So now when you post a listing, they're just pulling your data and now either taking that lead and, and servicing it or selling it back to you. Right. I, I mean, it's going to take a little bit of planning on how to, how to deal with this. Sure. Or you got to kind of, you got to kind of get in the game with them. Right. right? There's no, right. no other choice at this sure. point. Um, I don't know. Exa I don't know exactly. Um, what you do, because mm -hmm. the leads are so expensive right now with them. So what? Yes. I've never bought a lead in my life. You know that. Right. How much are leads going for today? Look, it depends on, on where you want to be. You want to be number one. You want to own some of the prime counties and towns. You're going to be paying. I mean, I know realtors that pay twenty to forty to 50000 a month. A to month. Zillow, a month to Zillow. They'll get back a hundred k you know. So they, will they could double their money. Oh, yeah. They could double the money. You know, I mean, if you treat them right and you're, you have a team of closers, you know, Sometimes the math works out, but you're still, it's, it's, it's your data. It's, it's yours to begin with, right? So you got, you, they insert themselves as a middleman and they're collecting these kind of astronomical numbers. And here we are. So know? obviously we know realtors funded the monster, like we said, right? Yeah. Obviously we've been back and forth. I think we first spoke in like 17 or 18, somewhere. Yeah, probably. Yeah, two, two, three, years four years ago, ago yeah. whatever it was. Everyone saw it coming. 
Yeah. But people in real estate, as you know, like most industries, it's a copycat industry, right? It's like, all right, I made a million dollars doing this. Now everyone tries and follows. And like, right. There's a constant wave of people trying to hit this million dollar mark, right? So now what happens if people's sole source of income and revenue came from buying leads and came from Zillow? Because I know most realtors that didn't like me in 2017, I came out mm-hmm. and basically said, fuck Zillow. Right. They didn't like me. They were like, no, you're wrong. How dare you say that? Like, I get all right. this. And I'm like, I'm trying to help you, idiot. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to, I'm not a realtor. I don't care about Zillow. I'll always be able to do business, right? You're mad at me because I'm telling you, hey, heads up, watch out. Four years later, we're here. So what does that realtor do now that can't generate their own business, has no relationships, doesn't like people, and can only get a lead in cold call? Look, you know, they're, they're, they're the prime leads. You know what I mean? They're some of the best leads, unfortunately. Is that true? That's true. They, they, people call you and they're like, I want to see this house in an hour. Now. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. can you take me now? And if you can't, the next agent will, you know? So, you know, I'm not in the Zillow game. Right. I, I, I don't, I haven't played in that game. I'm not interested in, I'll spend my money on my own campaigns and stuff like sure. that, but I'm not, I'm not in the game, but I know people that make their whole business on it. So what happens next now that their brokerage is- They have to go work for them essentially, right? Well, either that, or I guess you have to pay a referral fee. You know what I mean? Some type of hefty referral fee on the deal. I'm not exactly sure, but that's the way it's going to be because they're going to have their own agents now. Why are you going to give it out? Yeah, you don't need to. <laughs> keep it. You got the gold. Keep it, man. Right. You, you got, got it the all. gold and someone else funded the gold. They, they've, they've chipped away and chipped away and chipped away and here they are, you know? So now, obviously, we see a new influx of licensed realtors coming in the game, want to be realtors. And I, I respect it. Like it's, a free, it's a free market. And that's right. why I love a free market. But what I don't love is inexperience, not lack of education, right. and dirty competition. Right? right. And all three of those things come from desperation and experience, right. realistically. right? Now, everyone starts inexperience at some point. But as you know, in real estate... You have new people that know nothing about real estate that say, oh, I want 100% of the commission. It's like, well, how the hell are you going to learn? Like, you got to pay somebody. Tell me what you think about that. So it's, it's, there is an influx, you know, and right now I'm actually bringing five brand new agents, five or six brand new agents on um, with me. And the, the key to the whole thing is teaching them properly. You know what I mean? They, they, they are willing to give up a piece of the pie for education, you know, but the model that I'm running is different. It's a modern team. And they don't necessarily have to do that. It comes from the back end on the, on, the, on the brokerage side, which is, you know, a whole different story. But they have to be they have to be taught and trained and actually see what's going on. I, they come on appointments with me. I go on appointments with them. So the key is to get the new agents understanding how the business is done mm-hmm. and not doing it dirty. Because mm-hmm. you're going to come across dirty agents. You're going to come across everything dirty in this, everything everything yeah. in this industry yeah. become, becomes yeah. at some level can become corrupt yeah. or dirty or a lot of money involved yeah you know you, you know you start seeing you know big checks you know it's not like uh a lot of people are not used to seeing commission checks like this sure. before they get in sure. or commission checks at all sure they're, they're getting a salary they're trading their time for their money in a different aspect but money corrupts and to have that mindset that it could be done properly is this prop is, is very important to instill early in these new agents. I always think, again, obviously, you know, where we're at today is different from when I started in mortgages. So, like, I always blamed, you know, the mortgage people, for example, of like, look, you guys set the bar, right? Like, I'm yeah. just coming into the game at 20 years old. I'm looking at, I'm trying to find the bar, you know, like, where do I want to be? How do I measure myself? What goals right. do I want to hit? What accolades do I want to earn? Whatever, right? But in mortgages and real estate, the bar of entry is so low down here, yeah. you know, it's kind of like, well, you have 95 people doing things this way, which aren't doing them right. right. 5% that are untouchable, you'll never probably be able to close them out of business they do. But they've also been right. in business for an extended period of time or come from a background with a sphere of influence. Right. right? Like, call space B. That is what it is in today's world, yeah. right? Now, those 95 people will never be able to see or emulate those 5% because those 5% hold what they have in here and they don't really share all of their secrets, Correct. right? So all they know is the bottom 95% of the barrel of how they do things improperly the right. wrong way. And they're the ones out there with the loudest mouth that are reading people doing business the wrong way. And I always said like, why is nobody holding these people accountable here? Like here, here, if you follow football, like here's the Tom Brady, here's the Joe Montana, here's the Dan Marino. Try and be like them. Right. Don't try and be like Ryan Leaf. If you know who came into the league with Peyton Manning was supposed to be like, next best thing next to Peyton Manning. I think he had like a, whatever, a drug problem. It is what it is. Right. And 
Like he was in that one year. You know what I mean? Right. Not to use that as an example, but like, oh, it makes sense. It is what it is. Like, do you want to be Peyton Manning or do you want to be Ryan Leaf? They both got drafted in the same year. I think one and two overall in quarterbacks. One came out to be the best, and one fell to the bottom. Right. But why are you following Ryan Leaf if you want to be Peyton Manning? It's it's tough. You got you got to. What do they say? You know, your network is your net worth, or you know, surround yourself by five millionaires to be the six. Blah blah blah. All that stuff sure. that you hear and the motivational things, and you know, a lot of it's true. These new agents need to be surrounded by the right people. But also, there's got to be something inside that sets your own bar on a certain level to say, you know what, I'm not here to be average. You know what I mean? I'm here to be the top 5%. Then you get yourself in an area where you, there is certain aspects of this issue where you can access that 5% and get their playbook and understand sure, what they sure. do. Um, find that. Find that and get there and then listen. You know, because there's, there's teams, you know, I know teams in my life that went from $200 million to $300 million that opened their playbook to me. You know, and it's a, it's, and I listen and listen and be coachable. And, you know, for a long period of my life, I thought I knew a lot more than I really did. Mm -hmm. And it, it stifles you, you know? So once you open your mind, you get around the right people, you can get to be those Tom Brady's and you mm -hmm. can get there. You got to put, put your, put your head down and grind. In your opinion, what are some qualities or attributes that people have innately that then translate directly into becoming a successful realtor and then potentially a successful real estate Broker or member. Right. So there's 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 things that um, good realtors have. You know, there's a confidence about you. You understand how to how to treat people with respect. There's like a hospitality, um, maybe a gene or trait where you want somebody to have a good experience. You're not there just to grab that check and leave. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be, you know, they they everyone uses the term people person, right? This is a personal relationship business. You can learn that. You can learn how to communicate. You can learn how to how to how to sell. Right. With certain, you know, listening, asking the right questions, you know, but there are things you have to be a good person. You got to be you want to be ethical. Otherwise, the game is short. It could be big, but the game is going to be short. Very short. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, the biggest thing is what I found is, you know, once I found my confidence with this career, because this is my second career, that's when things opened up. That's when doors started opening up. And it was almost as if, you know, you go on a listing appointment and you're interviewing them, you know. Right. Do you want to hire them? Do I want to list your right. house? Do right. I want to work with you? You know, sure. and that it doesn't come off. You don't want it to come off as a certain way, arrogant or right. anything like that. But when you're when you know your worth, yep. people want to work with you. Yeah. Yeah. People Big want one. to work with you. And you're honest. You got to be honest. You got to tell people your house isn't worth what you think. What it's was worth. your first career? I was a, I, I guess I still am a chef. I owned restaurants. Oh, really? I owned BYOB restaurants in in, in uh, Jersey, Bergen County. Yeah. So that's obviously grueling hours, tough. Like you have to manage inventory and everything else, right? Never ending, man. And you can never probably do anything the best way because there's always something moving and going on, right? You miss one of your cooks or like you miss something. There's a lot more. You're so, hopping in for that guy who didn't call in sick. And anybody in the restaurant industry probably knows um, we're kind of maniacs. You know, we're not really sure. the uh, uh, kind of like social misfits a little bit. You believe that that trained you to be successful in real estate? 100%. Because like that's grueling, like nonstop. One hundred percent, and it's all client satisfaction, all client services, everything. I learned everybody's name. I, you know, you go and you shake hands, you meet people. I grew a network that I still work with. Um, I did it for twenty years, and I believe it. It is exactly what put me in a position to be able to be successful here, handle multiple things at once, delegate what I need to delegate, and know what my faults are and what my strengths are and be able to play to my strengths. Right. So if you're a chef, you might not be the best at making pastries or desserts. Yeah, exactly. Right. So but you buy need to be able to say, hey, I'm not great at this. Like, yeah, bring yep. somebody on board. So do you feel like that also propelled you forward in management and obviously, you know, doing what you're doing now? 100%. And leadership? I know now, like when I came to this industry, I knew I would do certain things. I knew my bad habits in business sure. and I know what I needed to kind of sub out. Um, I need to be with clients. All day, every day. That's or, who, or, who your worth is. Yeah. Yep. Or, you know, team members or people that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing my experiences with. And that's where I really get back from. I really enjoy that is teaching new agents and teaching even other agents a different way possibly or learning from them. Um, but, you know, coming from there and, and, and coming over to this business and being able to say, all right, I'm not going to do paperwork. I had to do it every day for 20 years and I'll I didn't even do it then, yep. you know? Yep. Yep. So, all right, I need, I need somebody to help me in that aspect. I need, I don't know. I could be myself 
which I, which I do on social media, mm-hmm. but I need somebody to do my ads. I need somebody sure, to, sure. To, to understand the, the background, the tech stuff. So I sub that stuff out and I concentrate on the, the, the income producing. What makes you money. Right, exactly. What you're best at. Yeah. So how long have you been in real estate for as of now? Uh, almost five years full time, just about five, actually a little over five years full time. And what got you to make that jump? And was it a smooth transition where you still cooked and then went into real estate? Or was it like, hey, I'm done. I will never be a chef again. Now I'm going into real estate full speed. So it was, uh, it was not smooth. It was a shit show, but I it's did. It's usually, it has to be. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I Very did. Very abrupt. It, yeah, exactly. Once I, I, you know, I was in the restaurants and I loved being a chef. I loved the chaos of it. I loved the whole thing, the action, the, the adrenaline. And I came to a point where I had two restaurants and I was never home. My wife was pregnant with our third kid and we were moving. And Wait, those was, donuts aren't for you. Those are for your wife and your three kids. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, the fish, <laughs> and the fish. Those damn fish, man. Oh my God, we'll get into that. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I realized, I think I, I said, I think I'm the last one at this party, man. I don't have passion for this anymore. I'm not enjoying it. Um, I hate waking up. No, I'm like, I got an 18 hour day. I got to run here. I got to run at two restaurants. On your feet all day. Oh yeah. And you know what? Christmas Eve, I'm at work. Valentine's Day, Mother's sure, Day. Sure. I'm there, yeah. you know? And yeah. it's like, you know, what I'm trading this time for is not worth it to me. So I, I was, I knew a lot about real estate. I had my own real estate investments. My father's an attorney. He was in real estate when I was a kid. He doesn't do it anymore. But I said, all right, I can take this network and I can trans, I can, I can kind of translate it into my new career. So I got my license. I worked on the weekends. I did open houses and stuff. Um, while I still had the restaurants, I got rid of one. The second one took me a lot longer to finish up and get rid of. So I just kind of lingered there in both for mm-hmm. six months. Mm-hmm. Then I moved to real estate full time. I made no money for like six or eight months. Nothing. Not so a fucking again, dime. How long? Six or eight months. Not so a would dime. you then say people that are getting into real estate should plan? And I think you're well ahead of the curve and more exceptional than yeah. the average person getting into real estate. If someone comes into the game, should they have eight months of payments and reserves and savings there before they actually come in? A year. Yeah, I, w- I would say I would tell somebody, look, so you I mean, you're not gonna make a million dollars in the first thirty days. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you you, yeah. you flip through the TV, and you watch these shows, and Hold it looks ball game. It looks simple, you know. Um, no, it, it was and it was grueling because you know you're walking, you're sure. going home after work, no paycheck, and you see your kids, and you yeah. got this new house, and your wife, and and there's there's no money. You know what I mean? So it's pressure. Hey, what'd you do all day? What'd you do all day? Well, Six yeah. Later, what'd you do all day? I see you're, you're saying you're working, but our yeah. bank account's going down. Just, you, know, you start thinking, should I just get a job? Should I just be a chef? Should I be a waiter? You know what I mean? Should I get a part-time job? And a certain point came in, in, in that six to eight months. I don't remember where it was. And I was getting a little bit of pressure outside and putting pressure on myself. Like, you know, maybe I made a huge mistake here. I said, no, you know what? I said, fuck that. I think that doubt is, is real. That's a real thing. Oh, it's real, man. It exists. And I said... I'm just putting my blinders on and I'm going to just tune in and I'm going to wipe the slate clean, be coachable. And I'm just going to push forward here. And then things started to happen. I found a little confidence and, you know, you got to have faith, you know, faith, you know, looking for results when there are none, believing that they're coming. What you know? do you personally do to build your networking relationships as well as focus on getting listings? I know you are great at getting, getting listings. What's your secret tartar sauce for that? <laughs> the, I, I use my network and my, my, my warm network, my sphere of influence. I hit that hard when I came over, but I had no experience. Right. So now that I have, you know, it takes a while to chip away and get the experience. I did prospecting. Um, I did it inefficiently for a long time. And then I, I learned a better way and that helps, but I hit the sphere of influence hard. Then it became referrals, you know? So now my phone rings. Look, I'm very grateful for that. My phone will, incoming calls come in. Uh, you know, I want to sell my house or this yep. or that. Or, and yep. you know, when I get a new listing, I reach out to the neighborhood. I, I do these things and I go and meet people. Um, I think that's your biggest strength. I mean, you're a people person, you're yeah. likable and you seem honorable and trustworthy. I think that's the name of the game, right? It's yeah. the handshake, ground the pound. So. My opinion is, yeah, Zillow can spend all the money on marketing, advertising, whatever, right? But there's still nobody that's walking into your house, knocking on the door, saying, hey, I'm Chris Tarda. Right. I'm your neighbor. Zillow's like, yeah, you might have a great online presence. You could be a discount brokerage, but there's something about like that personal knock. Yep. Delivering the YSO Jelly Donuts. Hey, by yeah. way, I'm selling the house next door. If you ever need to sell, I'm your guy. So that's exactly right. And, you know, I heard something, I think it was in a, in a, in a, in a song yesterday or two days ago. And it's, it, this, is, this is for every realtor, sure. but it says, you know, I'm something you, you're, you'll never be, and that's me. 
you know? So everyone's unique and everyone has strengths in a certain way. You got to make that connection and find how it works for you and shake that hand or, or these days, you know, whatever you're pound, doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I, I go to pound, they're like, yeah, how about elbows? I'm like, wait. Uh, there's a difference. Like, you know, yeah. like, if I got COVID, you're getting it on your hand, your knuckles, or your elbow. No matter what, man. It's the world we live but, in. Yeah, exactly. So, but play to that strength. You know, if you know you could connect, like I often go to listing presentations and I'll bring the presentation, I'll email it. We never get to it. Yeah. You never talk about it. It's just there. It's just, all right, here, here's my marketing stuff. We connect. It's all right, you know, I feel comfortable. I trust you. And these are my results. You look on Zillow, there, you know, there's all. I have all five-star reviews except for one, which was a competitor that gave me a zero. It's a bullshit review. But it's like, this will speak for that. Yep. Let's connect. Yep. And you get there. Everyone will get there. You just be be confident and be yourself. And you'll find your niche. What are you seeing with sellers right now in the marketplace? Are sellers listing high and coming down? Or are they listing fair and now being sold way over ask? So most of my listing presentations, most of my listing appointments involve a discussion about your self-imposed COVID tax uh, on, your, on, your, on your house because everyone thinks it's worth more. Everyone sure. sees the news. Sure. And the fact is, you know, um, not everyone agrees. You have to list a little high sometimes to take the listing if it's within a range where you think you can get the deal made right. and you can make that work out on the other side with the other realtors. But most of the time you need to explain, you know, I have a listing coming up in, in Ridgewood. It's, they think it's worth 1.2. It's worth 1.1, 1.125. So I have that conversation coming tomorrow, you know, and it is what it is. You know, they all have to understand that. And you get one chance to launch your listing. So you want to do it as, on the money as possible and get the results quickly. So, yeah, the sellers are a little bit disillusioned on their values. Mm -hmm. uh, buyers are pissed and, and, and depressed because, you know, you're walking into multiple offer situations. Very discouraging. Oh, my God. You know, and you could go on for months and they want to leave the city. They want to leave Hoboken and they want a piece of the suburbs, which is really where I do my work. And I handle a lot of that business. So that flow is great for you right now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. know, it was a, it, that's been a blessing for my business. Um, terrible for everything else, obviously. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. but, you know, it, that's how it's working ride the out. Wave while you can. Yeah, that's it. You know, so. The buyers are really frustrated. And what do you do to coach them and navigate them? Obviously, it's a very emotional business. You know, it's funny. So at heart, I'm an emotional person, right? Most people probably know that. When I say I'm emotional, like, yeah. Passionate. I think I'm passionate. Yeah. yeah. So there's passion, emotion, right? It's a healthy mix. So I always look at it as like playing sports always taught me how I always responded with anger, right? Like I'm not an angry person. Like right. I'm happy, friendly. You know me. Like yeah, I'll absolutely. give you a off my back in a yeah. second. Now, if you come at me, I only know how to respond with anger because I feel threatened, right? And that's obviously an emotion. Yeah. So part of the reason why residential mortgages in general were always a challenge to me is because I knew guidelines. I knew the black and white. Here's what we have to do to get this deal done. Here's what doesn't work, right? And everyone's emotional. No, 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 no. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is very black and white here. Right. You want your loan done. I'm telling you how to get it done. Right. But it's always like, well, my mother said, right? How are you dealing with buyers over anxiousness, over emotions? How do you respond to that and keep your level head? Because on the deals that we have worked on together, we've had the privilege of working on together. Yeah. You're a very level headed person. How are you able to maintain that in the overly emotional world we live in? I get emotional too. Do you? I, I do it outside of the outside of the deal, right? <laughs> I'll get pissed and I'll get, you know, people don't want to listen sometimes at all at all. Yep. And you know what? This is a huge, very personal transaction. Right. You get into people's finances. They think you owe, you owe them something by being the realtor. They, they, they feel that yeah. way, you know, and they see what you're making. They sure. think you're not you, know, you didn't earn it. Sure. You know, sure. um, but, you know, I have a real honest and frank conversation with buyers that I work with immediately one of the first conversations we have and i let them know depending on what price range you're looking in mm -hmm. you know if you're in that four to six hundred thousand dollar range right now you're in for you're, you're headed into a, a, com a competitive area and if you want to talk about taking a shot low balling and doing this and that it's not going to work right now you know and if you're not ready to go and if you're not a pre-approved if you don't have your ducks in a row yeah there's going to be lots of hurdles sure. so let's get everything ready and be prepared to possibly lose some deals if you're not ready to go over Asking now, so, are people in this market prepared to go over ask? Or yeah, do they still feel like they want to get a deal. They are or now. They just want the house. Most people that I work with, yeah, um, I let them know they have to. Yeah, you know, uh, 
it depends on you know you find a property maybe there's there's, sure. a, there's an outlier where sure. you can make a, a deal but yeah you got to be ready you know and and that's that you know you go in at 500 the house is listed for 500 somebody's gonna pay five and a quarter you know 520. it's funny i got a call yesterday and again everything that i say and put out there and write about i talk about my podcast is all from real life experience yeah. it's not like i read a book and i said hey here's my theory it's like no no it, it could shift on a phone call so last night, someone called me who I haven't spoken to probably in a couple of years, let's call it, a listing agent from the Bronx, mm -hmm. and said, hey, Jeff, you got any buyers for this two-family? And I'm like, well, I haven't done a mortgage in the Bronx since you know 2017. Like, obviously, I can still refer people out. Like, right. I know banks, I'm involved in transactions, but I don't do mortgages like that, and I don't have buyers just sitting here, hey, right. let me know if you got a two-family, you know? Shopping, yeah. Which was interesting because the thing about it, if he went that far back, it could have just been a friendly phone call, hey, how you doing, right. too, which is fine. But the premise of the call was, hey, I got this property. Hey, by the way, I'm dropping the price $10,000, right? So I'm like, wow, if you're calling me, thank you, right? Obviously, I appreciate you thinking about yeah. me. But that means that the market's not moving. Or right. now there is an immediate slowdown or hurdle. Or your listing is priced too high. Well, yeah. In your opinion, if you have a certain price point of a listing, does a $10,000 price improvement, which is not really, it's a price reduction, yeah. right? Yeah. really warrant that in this type of market? Like, does $10,000 in a list price make or break a deal? I mean, look, it, it, honestly, depending on the price, but I think you, 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 what you're talking about- It was like 790 I was going to say, it's got to be yeah. between seven, yeah. 700 yeah. million. No, it's a useless thing. Useless, I, right? I would tell my client, wait another two weeks and drop it 50. Right. You know, let's let's make a mark. You right. know what I mean? Let's right. you're, you're inching away. You're not, you're not helping yourself right. in that situation. Now you're chasing the bottom, essentially. Yeah, I mean, do the right thing. Drop it big, and maybe you get one or two offers competing against each other. You know, you don't you don't want to inch it back like that. Make the big move. Rip the Band-Aid off. Right. You're overpriced. How hard is that conversation, though, dealing with somebody? Oh, it's it's the, all they see is fifty grand lost, and, and and you have to explain. You know, it's not me. It's Plus not you. Fifty thousand lost, and then your commission coming off the top. <laughs> yeah, of course. That's <laughs> now they're eighty thousand yeah. lost. <laughs> Quick. And they're and they're they're not. You know. You got to make them understand that the market sets the price. It's not me. It's not you. We could ask whatever we want. We could think whatever we want. Sure. We put on the market and we don't get the money. You know, either you're going to be patient and wait months and months, or you're going to drop the price, get to the market. You got to meet the market every every deal, you know. And again, if you're overpriced and you make a deal, is it going to praise? Are you, you going to get knocked down then? Right. There's other Supply steps. and contingency. Yeah, I mean, there's tricks going through the whole thing, you know. And, you know. Residential buyers, at least in Jersey, you know, at these low price ranges, you got to be prepared to waive appraisals. And they are they doing that? Yeah. If, if they want the house, they're going to, you know, if you get multiple offers, the listing agent, I go back to the offers and I say, look, here's what we're looking for. It's not necessarily the highest sure, price. Sure. It's the conditions. Sure. You're going to waive inspections. You're going to live in inspections. You're going to waive your appraisals with a certain amount of leeway. It's what we need to hear, you know, because you actually said this in a post way back and it's, I believe it to be true. Appraisals are coming back short, three, five percent, and the banks know this is bullshit. The banks know absolutely the gig's up. You know what I mean? So they're they're telling the people, let's try to keep it in line here with what's reality, and not just this hype in this market right now. So you, you it's a challenge on the deals, you know, with the right with the with in certain price ranges. Yeah, I think you know, like I said, I did write a post about my a Harlem deal I was working on where pre-COVID we got it appraised at three point two or three point three million. And the borrower fumbled, like most silly <laughs> borrowers do, especially in like the Harlem area. Okay. And brought the deal back to life. Now we need two appraisals, so we get it done. One comes back at two point four. Oh my God. Five months later. And I'm oh. like, there's no way this property dropped thirty percent. It's a beautiful brownstone in Harlem off Madison. Like yeah. this is this is prime, prime real yeah. estate. Like I can see three million, maybe ten percent drops right. because of fear and unknown, but Again, it's not a condo in a very stagnant building. Right. It's like a beautiful, beautiful landmark property. So I'm like, order the other one. We order it. It comes back at, I think, 2.86. I'm like, okay, reasonable. We're getting there. I'm like, order a third one. Just because I want to know, hey, someone's not doing their job properly. Right. Again, either you don't know Manhattan real estate, you don't know Harlem, or you simply just collected your appraisal fee, which are all inflated now because we're at an all-time shortage of appraisers, licensed right. appraisers. So if anybody's looking for a job or career, become an appraiser, do your apprenticeship. I mean, you're going to make money. Like, right. There's a shortage. You know, With the whole refi boom and loan modifications going on right now, yeah. there are not enough appraisers in America. Some appraisers are taking four to six weeks to turn around reports in, in parts of the country. That's how big the yeah, shortage is. That's insane, is. man. We're waiting for appraisals all the time. So the third appraisal comes back. 
right? The first lady that brought it at 3.3 brought this in at 3.2. So now we have three appraisals done in a matter of five business days, as low as 2.4 and as high as 3.2. Who's right? That's insane, man. Who's right? Because the, they're not even in the ballpark. Not 3%, not 5%. We're yeah. talking about 30% discrepancy in valuations. You know, it's like, what do you do? Okay, you have a seller that wants to sell a house for a million. They sell it for a million. Mm -hmm. And now it appraises at $950,000. Yeah. What do you do as a listing agent? So you got to do a couple things, right? You got you to approach your seller, you know, and let them know, okay, here's the appraisal. We can ask for an appeal. We can, we can go back to them. We can cancel the deal and, and, and still wait for your 100000 mm -hmm. and get this appraised again. Mm -hmm. You know, we can negotiate, try to meet in the middle, 975 or something like that, if they're comfortable with that. You know, and it, ultimately the, the choice is up to them. But I try to work the deal out. I try to either appeal, if that doesn't work, which it rarely does, it's not going to do 50,000. You know, they, the appraisers don't like to admit they're wrong or, or, or change anything, you know. So um, I usually, you know, I, I try to get the deal done. At what point do they come to you and say, cut your commission? Every, almost every time. First, that's the first, <laughs> that's the first thing, right? You're going to chip in, you know? And what you, I know you're a team player, so I'm assuming you're fair in that regard. But ha, look, let's look at that, right? So, okay, you're selling a house for a million. Let's just say for argument's sake, your commission's 5%, right? Mm -hmm. Which is $50,000. Mm -hmm. Now, that house appraises at 950000 Now, let's say you're keeping 25000 right, for you and your brokerage. And the buyer agent's keeping 25000 How do you whack that up? Because the seller's like, look, I, yeah, I got nine fifty, but your commission is the one that's costing us this deal here. Right. So they're looking. That's you how know, they look at it. Without the commission, they're they're netting the same. Of course. Right. So they they approach us, and and I'll approach the buyer's agent. What I'll do is, well, yeah, I'll say, look, man, here, here's the deal. Like they're, they're wanting to chip in. If you want to work for your buyers, if you're willing to chip in, let me know a number. But first, let's try to work it out every other way possible. Sure. Get the appraiser rebutted. Whatever. Yep. I tell my sellers, I say, look, I, I'm not saying yes, or I'm not saying no right now. Mm -hmm. Um. This is my income. Yep. So let me use the tools I know how to use. And then let's have a discussion once that's done. If we can't, if I can't satisfy you with what I know how to do, then we'll discuss that. I'm a team player. So now you become a problem solver. Right. Like, let me go to work. That's crazy. Let me earn my money. Right. Let me earn this right. check. Right. So if, if I can get them to come up, if I, can, you know, they love the house, you know, get them to reach in their savings, whatever they're going to do sure. Sure. And, and put in the extra money or some. Then I can go back to the seller and say, all right, we got them up to 980, 975. We got the appraisal, whatever it is, whatever I've been able to pull off. And, and then usually they're like, all right, and, you know, maybe now you earned your money. You know? at, at what point does real estate become real estate collecting versus real estate investing, right? So you have people, everyone wants to be a real estate investor today. There's fix and flip loans out there. You don't really need to have much to qualify. Mm -hmm. If you don't have anything to qualify, your uncle probably can figure it out or make ends meet. You mm -hmm. met somebody's assets or somebody's good credit. You can figure it out. Yeah. Maybe partner with the contractor, right? But some deals are being purchased right now, which I'm sure you're seeing, and that it's like if rents drop or you, you know, miss a vacancy, you're going to lose money. Mm -hmm. So how do you look at that you know, market right now between real estate collecting versus real estate investing? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough market right now because everything's really tricky. You know what I mean? Everything, you get in that deal, you know, this, this market is, is hyped up right now. You could easily lose money on a flip if the market switches in the spring. Like, let's say we get a, a giant influx in inventory. Sure. You're going to, you're going to be hurting. Let's say the contractor's running slow. Sure. Your, 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 your building costs are up. I mean, lumber's up what? A lot. 50, 60, 70%. Yeah. I don't know. Two by four last year, I think it was two bucks. Now it's seven bucks. Big number. You have for a thousand house? square foot house. Yeah. Sure, sure. I mean, so, you know, these these investors and these flippers, really, you got to have your timing down. You got to have your money liquid or the draw ready, however you're doing your yep. deal. Um, and it's tricky right now, you know. But again, these investors, too, like, they can't foreclose right now. A lot of people are behind their mortgages. There's Liz Pendants. I think in New Jersey, there's ten or 12,000 new Liz Pendants recently. You know, crazy. And It's crazy. So when they rip that Band-Aid off, I don't even know what's going to happen. I don't think they're going to. So that's interesting. That's nothing. They're going to keep that. punting, right? Again, at the end of the day, you, you, it's like, all right, we built one bridge, we built a second bridge, and now we built the third bridge, right? Mm -hmm. So let's just talk about like the PPP is back now, right? Yep. And obviously we had the link, you know, so it's funny. Talk about marketing. We'll, go, we'll get off topic, but right. bring it back to this, this, this Band-Aid, right? So I came out with my speculation on what's going to happen. Like, you know, at the end of the day, when COVID first happened, I see the fallout coming March 2022. So next March, right? right? About 15 months from now, today. That's what my initial prediction was, right? But now you're seeing all the backlog where 
now we're 10 months and zero court proceedings have happened. Zero <laughs> recourse has happened, right? So now PPP comes out, that prolongs us, call it, you know, for your average person, six months, give or take. So if you started in March to June, that buys you from, let's say, April to December. Right. Now we have January 11th, the new PPP comes out. So I get the link to the actual SBA lender. Right. I go to GoDaddy, I buy a domain, yeah. deposit that PPP.com. So deposit that PPP.com. It takes you right to the link, the portal. I can brand it with my podcast. Go to the link, sign up, apply for your PPP. I'm a big believer of if the government's giving it, you take it because right. everyone's been impacted one way or another, right? So someone said, realtors shouldn't get PPP. I disagree because what if you have a kid at home and you can't go out on showings because you're afraid of getting COVID? You don't want to bring it home to your kids, your parents. Like, or what if your spouse works? Now you need to work, but they can't go to work. Now they've been laid off from work. Now they got to watch the kids. They can't go out and apply for new jobs. So in my opinion, if the government's giving PPP and you legally qualify, take it. That's where I come from, right? So that, that's my mindset because look, I agree. It, like we didn't make the parameters. Like, it's not like you rigged it. So you get PPP. If you submit all your documents and the government SBA says you're worthy, you're worthy. Right. Like, you know, it's not like I made a rule that only I benefit from. Right. So that's my mindset of it. So I want to see everybody take advantage of the PPP because there are scammers out there taking advantage of it that don't deserve it. Right. So the people that actually need it or qualify, take it. Right. But we've now built an expectation of, Oh, Shit went wrong. Shit got hard. Yeah. Now Bail you get your hand out. out. Like I didn't get PPP. I don't qualify for a PPP. You know. Right. I've been self-employed since 2009 and 10. I never got an economic stimulus. I never right. qualified for it. You <laughs> right. know. So I'm like, you know what? Let me dig deep. Let me figure it out here. Let me figure out what I have to do. Right. But again, it's easy to just sit back and say, hey, let me take this. Right. So now this is going to carry us through the next three months. But our eviction is going to be able to be happening? I don't know. I don't think so. Are banks going to foreclose? I don't know. I can tell you every single bank that I've spoke to on the residential side and commercial side says, we are not interested in being landlords. We will do whatever it takes to work this out. Right. Or they're not working with you at all and they're just starting the foreclosure process. Right. So what's going to happen? Now the court's sitting here, the judge is going to have 10,000 cases probably <laughs> per county. You don't have, like, even if you have five judges and, you know, whatever, 20 prosecutors to try and yeah, figure it out. You can't work around the clock fast enough. There's not know? enough hours yeah. in a day, you know? And then it's like, okay, well, who made that mistake? Wait, oh, I called Wells Fargo for a modification. They told me they were going to send the paperwork. They never sent it. Now you challenge or dispute it. No judge is going to sign their name right. willingly to kick somebody out of a house today. Right. They're not. So... Again, what happens? I honestly just see somehow, some way, the government either giving some type of forgiveness, requiring modifications to happen. Right. So if you were behind $80,000 in your mortgage, you're legally required to put on the back end, tell us what you can pay per month, automatic flex modification given. There's got to be something like that because it's getting too much. But then know? the other thing is no one talks about, then, okay, so now you get foreclosed or evicted. Then where do you go? That's the other thing. Yeah, exactly. Where Who's taking gonna, you? Where are you going to go? You're, you're screwed for how many years, you know? And, and you know, maybe again, they're going to have to do something like that. If you get foreclosed, maybe you do a deed in lieu of foreclosure. You hand it over. You leave with your credit intact. Who knows, you know? There, but we've kicked the ball this far. The government's been involved. They've moratorium on everything. Billions Eviction, and billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. They're giving it out. And I agree with you with the PPP. Yeah. I remember last March and April sitting in my house, looking yeah. out my window, yeah. not working, saying, scary. What am I going to fucking do? Right. Like, how am I going to handle this? Realtors are essential. They aren't essential. You can show properties. You can't show properties. Well, I was sent home one day Who's by moving? a cop. <laughs> What are you doing? I said, I'm out. I'm going to work. I'm yeah. a realtor. You're not essential. Go home. I said, what are you kidding me? And now I'm looking. By the way, do you want to sell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's like over and over. Um, I sat in my, I have a little home office. I'm looking out the window. I'm like, there's no car. Eerie. It's eerie, man. And I'm like, is, is am I going to die going to the grocery? Like, that's how bad it was. You know what I thought like, about driving to the city today? So yeah, I don't know how you drove in. I drove in today, but. You ever seen the movie with Will Smith? I Am Legend, I think it's called. I never saw it, but I heard it. So, awesome. like, the city's vacant. Like, there was a play going on. Like, it's just him and his dog, and he's, like, fighting zombies, whatever it is. I hate saying it, but driving into the city today, I'm an action guy, right? I love action. Yeah. I love Times Square. Like, I thrive in that. As chaotic as it might be, I thrive in chaos, kitchen, right? Man, like a man, driving in here, it was like, all right, you see some construction workers. You see, like, the little old lady walking her dog. You see a couple guys on the street. I didn't even see homeless people today. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, man. There's nobody around. But that's in in the suburbs. It's it's not the same. But it's to me that's where I am now. And you know, people are just 
they're just walking more. You see more people out. You see less cars. You know, I see more. You know, a lot less cars now that school. Two of my kids are back in school. We go. Full time. Uh, no, not full time. No, and a lot since before Thanksgiving, they were all home, and last year they were all home. It's insane. It's just insane. You know, but tough. Again, going back to the PPP, like my wife can't go to work. You know, and I, I'm a, I can work from home most days, yeah, yeah, so I can yeah, help, flexible. but not really. You know not what with I three mean? Kids. Right, and and you know what, like the the more I help with the school and the family, the more your business suffers. Right. So you know, she has a job. My wife has a full time job. What does she do? She does corporate event planning. So she would do sales meetings, crushed. which crushed. They said that industry took a th- and I, don't quote me on this. I believe a thirty billion dollar loss last year alone. I'm sure because everything that they had booked for the year. Canceled. canceled immediately. Deposits refunded everything. Yeah, and they and and that was even tough getting deposits back. A whole bunch of things. And they all re from my wife's job. They rebooked for this spring. Now that's gonna be pushed back. Now they're all canceled. But all the contracts now have non-refundable deposits. It's so just, how do you balance that? So she gets to work from home now. So she she's full pay, same pay as everything, or no? Did they come yeah, back at all? Yeah, they got her they got her PPP. job. She got a big PPP. So she's. You know, what she does for the company, she doesn't do the events anymore. Sure. She's more of an office person, sure. which there's not, there's less workflow for what she right. does now. Right. So she's lucky in a way. So at but what point, and this is like what I say, like we really don't know productivity from companies and working from right. home, vice versa, kids, it's not like, look, it's tough enough working from home, being isolated, depression, anxiety alone. Now you had three kids, a dog, fish, wife, everything else, right? Clients, business, all the unknown. And then someone like your wife, for example, the company looks at it and is like, hey, on, we're paying this lady $100,000 a year. Mm-hmm. Our events are down 40%. She's doing 40% less work. Now we offer her 60000 Like, At what point do corporations, when they don't have PPP, or is PPP a thing forever, for eternity now, to say, hey, like, this doesn't make sense here. You know? I think- It has to come at some point. Well, it's the market, right? That's free. That's the that's the it's capitalism. Right. That's that's the right. markets. Eventually, they you have to deal with these things, and you have to you know these businesses have to put this out there when their re- regulations are gone or the the PPP runs out or whatever, and now you're back to paying your people with whatever it's going to be. They got to take a look at these things. My friend, who's a CFO of a company, uh, she actually lives in Massachusetts, and the company is based out of Jersey, but she's a virtual CFO. Like yeah. obviously, some some companies offer that, which is great. I think that's great, right? She was like Why that not? before COVID. Um, I sent her the link because we talked the first go around. We were talking about PPP and stuff. I sent her a link. She's like, wow, thank you so much. Just in the nick of time. I just laid 13 people off yesterday because they didn't know. They're like, look, it's January 10th. We don't know what's going on with the PPP. You posted this. I posted it. I posted it. Literally just happened. She's like, and I'm looking at it like, you know what? I just helped save 13 people's jobs. I don't care. From a link. Because you never know who needs it. Right. And some people are so caught up in, yes, no, well, I got to wait for my bank. My bank's not offering it yet. No, no, no. Here's the direct link. I already got four people approved in the first 24 hours. Right. Like, click this friggin' link, apply. It's all digital. There's no people. There's no bankers getting back to you. You answer the questions. You upload your documents. Take humans out of this because the banker's sitting home scratching his ass, right? Collecting his paycheck while you're waiting for your hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay your people. Right. It's got to be fast action and it's got to be like direct like that. You know, I'm in all these different groups, text groups, Cut the bullshit message, out. and they're all saying, who does this and who, where can I do this? And they're recommending a different bank or a different person or this person will do it for a fee. You know, like a human being can only do so much as one person. Right. Technology can handle the volume. Right. So the, the issue is getting there and getting your money. You know, the, these companies need their money fast and it's, um, it's crucial to what's going on. Without right COVID companies need that money fast. Yeah. Now well, I, I had payroll for twenty years in the restaurant. So you know, I know it's slow Horrible. week. You know, Yo, you're not eating. You don't have your put. You don't have. You your, might be because you were a chef, but I eat. Yeah, but yeah. maybe not. Have, maybe not get paid. Yep, yep. <laughs> you know? No, that's real. Yeah, that's real. That's a real deal. And and you know, it's it's people aren't going to show up if they're not getting paid. You know, do you think someone should be a realtor full time? Truthfully, in in today's world where we're heading, obviously you're established. You have your book of business. You're, you you've been there, right? You're not 25 to 30 years old trying to make it, trying to be a wholesaler. Right. Should somebody be a full-time real estate agent today in today's world if they're getting into it? Um, I think you. I think there's a place for it. I think that, I think when you, you go do. full-time, yeah, I think you can be, look, you can have a, another side hustle, another type of way to bring in money. Um, I have a couple different ways that I, I, things that I work. Are you still stripping or no? <laughs> no. <laughs> Those days are over. I'm too old now, man. <laughs> You're 40, that was it. That's Chip, it, no man. more Chippendales. <laughs> um, but if you if you 
put your time in, you can make the money. You can have a great career doing this. And if you need to do the side hustle, I think you do it the other way. Make this your full time and have a side hustle. What are some complimentary side hustles that would be great for a new realtor, right? So like, I'll give you an example. Like, I think like bottle waitresses should be realtors because why? You're at a club, people are spending hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. They're probably generous. They got, t- you know, they're tippers. They're spending money. They're right. obviously looking for real estate or hustling some way. So like, I use like bottle servers could be great realtors. What are some other side hustles? It's great. I met with somebody yesterday who's a bartender and he's planning on, he's a bartender in uh, Weehawken, big restaurant. And uh, he's going to be, he's he's finished a class next week. He's like, I'm never going to give that up. I have have a wealthy clientele there. They do a lot of business. So I'm going to continue being a a bartender in hours that you wouldn't really work real estate anyway and develop a a sphere of clients from there. You know, so I think any hospitality industry like that, especially when it's the opposite of the regular world hours, restaurants, bars, like you said, sure. um, you know, all things like that are complimentary because you turn those ten dollar tips into, you know, and then they're like, oh, call this guy. You know, that's a great or, way or to come generate by for it. a free drink after we close, whatever right. it is. Yeah. You know, have a dinner, come by, come for a drink, you know, whatever it is. Those are all complimentary to being a realtor and it helps you build that client base. How do you look for partners, whether it's an attorney, a mortgage company, let's specifically touch on mortgage. Like, what do you look for in a mortgage professional or a mortgage not so professional? How do you like add them to your arsenal? What do you look for? How do you cultivate a relationship with them? And at what point do they become like your preferred lender? Or at what point do they become somebody you just might send deals to once in a while? Explain that hierarchy. There's no end of people reaching out, right? Wanting to do business with realtors. Yep. And I'm sure it's the other way too. Yep. You know what I mean? So I look for a couple of things. Honesty. I want to know straight up if this person can get, if we can close this loan. No bullshit. And uh, access. Client satisfaction. How important is that, access? It's the most important. You know, on a Sunday, I need to reach you. You got to answer. If I need that updated pre-approval, especially in this market, there's five other offers going in. If we're waiting until Monday morning, it's not going to It's too late, man. It's too late. You know, so those are the things that I want. And, um, you know, it's, those are the, the, the non-negotiables, really. Access, honesty, and, um, you know, even if it's a call to me outside of the, of the deal, say, look, man, this is shaky. We've you had know. a couple of those. We went through the, real. We went through the uh, a real tricky one. Yeah, you know, and um, but that's the thing is, you called me and you said what well, had to get done, and we got it done. You know, and you. And- How crucial is that though, right? So like, a realtor is not confident. If I call a realtor and say, "Look, here, if you want this deal done, you need to express this to your client." I've already said it ten times. They're clearly not hearing me. We're not speaking the same language, right? But having a I'm going to say a man or a gentleman's conversation mm-hmm. or a professional conversation with, with our goals to close this deal. Here's how it has to get done. Yeah. How crucial is that little five second conversation? It's absolutely crucial. Otherwise all that time invested goes to the wayside. It doesn't close. Um, and Cause I have mortgage lenders that I know personally that are like, I hate real estate. I want to talk to realtors. Why are they calling me? Why are they bothering me? I'm like, do you realize that they're your best friend? If you just pick up your phone, they're handing you money. Yeah. But you want to finish your bowling session or you want to <laughs> finish your movie. You know what I mean? It's Talk crazy, about that. man. It's crazy because if I can, you know, the, the people I deal with will call me and they'll say, listen, Chris, so-and-so, you know, is short or they put money in their account that they shouldn't have. It's not seasoned. It's not this. We don't know where it came from. We can't source it. We have to make it happen this way or that way because I don't know how to do a mortgage. Right. And, and right. I don't really give a shit. Right. I don't want to know. Right. Like, that's another thing. Like, if you tell me what has to be done, I can make that message however I want with the client and at least call you back and say, look, it's never going to (laughs) happen. How do you look at, okay, so like, let's say you sent me five deals and I haven't sent you shit back, sent you no leads. I sent you a thank you, whatever. And then I send you that listing or I send you that buyer. Like at what point does reciprocation come in? And at what point just doing your job the right way factor into that? And then also at what point do you have that? I call it a business discussion of, Hey, look, I'm sending you all my business. Let's share in this marketing expense or let's share in this podcast ad or let's do X, Y, and Z. What problem that I see today is people are like, I do no deals. I want you to give me $500 a month because you're the mortgage guy. And it's like, wait, you do no deals. I don't need your extra deal. You know, how do you have that discussion? And when does that come about? And what's fair and reasonable to Chris Tard is liking? So I don't even, I appreciate business being sent back to me, but I'm sending business where I know 
the result is going to be a closed deal. So, you know, if we're going to share in some marketing, great. You know, at the end of the day, if it comes up, I'm not going to call and ask. You know, you're not going to call and ask. No, I'm not going to. Do you think that devalues you if you call and ask? I don't think it devalues you, but but I think I think it's I think I appreciate the business as it is and knowing that I appreciate the business and, and you know, the fact is the results are there, right? Yep. So we're all getting paid at the end of the day. Yep. That conversation happens organically. I'm not calling and say, look, you know, I'm not looking at my bills at the other month saying, look, I mean, I spent a thousand bucks on Facebook ads yeah, last yeah, yeah. week. I need somebody to chip in on yep. this. This is, this is crazy. Yep. People are doing that. Oh yeah, man. People, people call and ask for money and ask for a piece of everything. Like they deserve it. Yeah. And then, and then don't reciprocate. I know that happens a lot. They'll take money. They'll, they'll Funny story. I've never told this story on a podcast. And I hope the person that's listening to this is the person this story is about. I'm not going to say the person's name. Yeah. But I have a lot of stories, as you know, right? <laughs> Funny stories. I was paying $700 a month in 2012, let's call it, when Boomtown first came out. Now, remember, I'm not a lead guy. I share. And if you send me deals and we're going to do business together... I'm not paying you kickback referral fee, but like if we're going to build the business and you're going to handle the buyers and refer them to me, I was doing mortgages. Like I have every right to chip in because I'm a team player. Like right. if I'm making 10,000 and you're making no thousand, okay. But, but if you're giving me a deal and I'm closing a tough deal, we're even, we're square. You know, I was paying like 700, I think it was 700 for Boomtown. Six months goes by, haven't closed a deal from the guy. So I'm 4,200 at this point. I'm like, this guy doesn't even call me. He doesn't send me any other business. Like what the hell is going on here? Right. I was paying for the boomtown and he was sending my leads to another lender. So that's insane. And I'm like, where's the integrity? I'm like, dude, I'm not worried about the 4,200. I want to rip your head off right now because I'm doing this to help you. I already, I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. My couple of first years in the business, you're a shithead. Yeah. You know, because I'm funding you. You're not even doing any deals. Like yeah. I'm confused. And you're giving them to somebody else. Like, I don't need your couple of deals that you can give me per year. Like, right. I'm doing this to help you. And then you're scumbagging me. Right. Talk about that. Because obviously, realtors and mortgage people in general, people are unethical. That happens a lot. And I hear about that a lot. And that's a situation that I'll, I'll never want to, I'll never be in. You know, I don't want to be that way. There's people that, you know, we have plans and ideas and we build things and we do things together. And that's different because the, the business goes back and forth and sure. you reciprocate, you know, sure. and you kind of realize like, all right, I, I want to do business with this person or I do do business with this person. Let's do the right thing here, you know. And if somebody's – I know when I reach into my pocket for something and somebody's, you know, you, you want value back. You're spending money, you expect the value somehow. Or you don't, but you know that. You know, you get into it. It's yep. just a losing yep. whatever yep. whatever the situation is. So you build something together, but you – you abide by what you said you're going to abide by. And definitely, you know, if, if you're paying for my marketing and it's getting results and I'm not sending you the, the leads back, you imagine that? it's insane. insane. It's insane. Because look, it's like me, me paying for leads and not, and not getting them. Right. It's exactly, right. What, it's it exactly is, what it is. You know, and, and that doesn't last. If you're not getting results, you either change it, you, you nix it, you get out of, you get out of your way. Um, I try not to get involved in, in, in too much of that. I'd rather build something together, put money in with something, sure. and, and have an idea of how to build something long term. How important is that? What you just said right there, the being mutually—I call it mutually invested. Yeah. Like and being like-minded. How important is that? And why is that not discussed more inside of real estate and mortgages? Like, let's build an empire together. Let's do this together. Why is that frowned upon? I think I don't. I don't even know that it's it's frowned upon as much as I think. Or it's just not talked about. Well, I think a lot of agents may have a feeling that they have the keys to the kingdom. They do. Well, they do until Zillow takes over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and they're like, all right, you want my business, you're going to buy it or pay for it, or I need to get compensated for it in ways other than just closing the deal, you know? And, you know, I mean, I understand that. I understand the sentiment. I understand is there's capitalism. You could, you know, you could charge what you yeah, could charge yeah, for. Yeah. But um, I don't know. It, it should be talked about a little bit more and, uh, you know, open it up a little bit, you know, because I don't know, you, you, you start mixing money and, and it's a back and forth thing. You owe somebody something, yep, yep, you yep. know, and that's a bad way to, yep. that's a good, bad spot to come from. I as close to 50, 50 as possible. Or, you know what, like I say, if, if, if we're going to spend, we're going to split a Zillow campaign, thousand bucks a month, we're each in for 500 bucks. Yep. All right. Now we're, now we're both in, right. you know, right. and, there's no reason for me not to give you the lead and there's no reason for you not to give me the lead and it works. You know what? Sometimes leads like that, I may lose and the, and the lender ends up closing. And vice versa. Exactly. So, you know, you got to really... 
Be sure who you're invested with. Mm -hmm. And when money starts getting involved, be sure you're getting uh, uh, what you think is a value for your money. Even if it's zero and you want to help somebody, sure. at least be comfortable with that. What are some of the biggest problems you're seeing in today's real estate environment? Um, you know, it's, it's money's cheap. Everybody's running around, you know. Big checkbooks. Yeah, everyone's got money right now, you know. And, and it's weird because you see the, 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 the economy tanking. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. actually, certain areas are flying, yep. certain areas are tanking. Yep. Yep. And, um, it, you know, so I don't know if people are getting themselves in trouble or people are going to end up being underwater in a year or two. You know, when, what happens if you get a 50% inventory spike this spring? Or rate two to 5%. Yeah. What is going to happen? You know what I mean? Things are going to come to a screeching halt. It's a different ball game all of a sudden. And that can happen. You can turn on a dime. I saw a, a, a YouTube video yesterday, uh, and I didn't really watch all of it, but... You know, the, the crux was housing crash in 2021, you know? That was from Matt DeFeed. I think Matt DeFeed posted it. I don't know. Matt maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't see that happening. I don't either. So what's your sentiment right now from buyers and sellers? Is everyone kind of just riding the wave, riding the highs? Yeah. I think I think this continues at least through this year. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't see anything huge coming to change it. Right. The, the government's propping everything up. The yep. rates are going to stay low. Yep. What, what the? I mean, the rates shouldn't change for a while. Ever. They say 10 years. <laughs> okay. So there you go. So... How does that work? You know, what is the impact of that in the long run? But eventually, in our areas, everyone will have moved or sold or, 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 or refied already. Right. So then what? Right. You know, so then what happens? The sellers that I'm working with now understand that the timing is unique. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to sell. Have you had anybody say, I want to sell right now, take advantage of the pricing, because I never thought my house would be this. Yes. But I'm not willing to buy right now because I'm not going to sell high and buy high. Have you heard that at all? Yes, people believe pe people think that they can't buy now because they're overpaying. Correct. And but they just oversold. <laughs> that's the truth. You know, they're trying to collect on both sides. Right. And I try to explain that to them. I also say, you know, you got to also realize that it's a once in a lifetime selling opportunity. It's a once in a lifetime borrowing opportunity, most likely. Sure. You know, I know people that I speak to a generation above me were paying 12 for 13, 14, 15% for loans Correct. in the eighties, you know, yep. and, and adjustable rates too. And they were good. They felt happy that yep. way. Yeah. You yep. know, what are my daughters going to be paying and, and, and their families? Zero. You know? Maybe, but one, who knows? And again, is that all propped up by the government again? How, how does that work? You pay 0% on your sure. mortgage and 75% sure. of taxes. Sure. You know? well, look at this right here. It's so funny. You said that, right? So the PPP loans, for example, Banks are getting a 5% premium just for doing these loans. Really? Right? Now, think about this. The borrower is taking out, I'm just giving you, let's use an example, yeah. $100,000 they're taking out, right? They have no payments, say, I think for the first year, let's call it. But if they're borrowing a million dollars, the bank's lending them a million, and the feds are reimbursing them a million fifty thousand. So the feds are already losing 5% on the money, right? Now, you're deferring a first-year payment out. That means that after year one, the feds are really negative 6%, mm -hmm. right? Because they're, they're obviously not accruing yeah. interest, regardless of what they're borrowing at. That means then the borrower has to make five or six years consecutive payments just to potentially break even. How does that work? Wow. Think about that. But that's how mortgages are if, you know, federally backed loans, FHA loans. You know, so when someone does a loan at 2.5%, no points, the lender then takes the loan, lends the money, and then they collect, let's say, a five-point premium. Mm -hmm. But the bar hasn't even made a payment yet. Again, how does that work? You know, so you're really you're really working from a deficit. Yeah. So if people start defaulting on these or they they aren't forgiven, how does that end up? The government's already starting off negative five percent every deal they do for the yeah, people to get paid back. <laughs> it's it's I didn't know that's exact I didn't know that's how that's it's working. Number. Right. And you, you multiply that by the you know what's billions. Hundreds trillions. Of, trillions probably, right? At the end of this. Because you got to make the bank's capital. Right. And there's going to be the new new administration's coming. There's going to be another multiple trillion dollar Easily. plan in the next yep. two or three months. Yep. You know, the one that's going on now is just to just to hold us over completely, <laughs> completely. You know, and yeah, we'll see you in spring. Well, yeah, and it's going to happen right away. And what you're saying is, you know, to me that blows my mind a little bit because I, I I often see this stuff. I'm like, how does this work? Who's get, who's making money on this? Correct. You know, I know banks. the banks have to, right? With no recourse, no risk. No risk. Zero risk. It all gets assumed by the government. All of it. And the government loses money every time they take a breath. You know? yeah, right, so right. It, it's like, right. who's really paying? Taxpayer. Has to be, right? At some point. I mean, what? what is it? You know, how do they? That's who pays for all this. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know how it plays out. 
What are you looking to do now from like back to real estate, what you're doing? Obviously, you're with EXP. Mm-hmm. You know, two years ago, I told everyone and their mother EXP was the next best mm-hmm. thing. I told everyone to buy their stock at seven or eight bucks. Yeah. I, you saw all the hate messages I was getting. <laughs> everyone from Keller Williams was telling me, I'm getting paid by EXP. I heard it all, as you right. as you see publicly, like yeah. whatever, it is what it is. Nice, it was nice to take a little break from that on Facebook, but now yeah. I'm back. Now I'm ready to come, you know, stone for stone. Right. Talk about EXP. Talk about the model. Talk about see where you're going, um, how you see yourself evolving, and the stock price. So they, Those can't be ignored. It's, it shouldn't be ignored by anybody. You know, and I'll tell a quick story, and then I'll get into the model and whatnot. But yesterday I got a call from a, a Keller Williams team leader. And we wanted to see if I was interested in having coffee and chat. And I said, I'll have coffee with you if, if we could compare models. And she was laughing. And she was like, oh, no, no, you know, you know I've been I've been in real estate forever. I've found my home here at Keller Williams. Can't do math, but I'm in real estate forever. Well, I said, that, that's awesome. You know, I'm really glad you, you, you found your spot. I said, yeah. but just so you know, I was at Keller Williams before too. And, you know, I'm making six figures more than I was there, even if I'm doing the same business. And she said, what? You know, I said, so fast forward till today, we're going to have coffee next week, mm-hmm. you know, and it's going to be about – our model. Right. Um, our model is disruptive. Uh, it was forward thinking. Yep. It was perfect almost timing. perfect timing. Exactly. I was just going to say it was like custom made for what's going on in the yep. market today. Yep. Everything's virtual. There's no office. It's cloud based. I can go anywhere. I can work from anywhere. Um, I had a game changing moment a year and a half ago when I was the first vacation my wife and I took without our children. I was in Mexico with my wife. I closed the deal. I got the scan. I up. I up. Closed the deal with your wife or closed like a real estate <laughs> no, deal? <laughs> still closing that deal. <laughs> yeah. um, still pending. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I, I, I uploaded all the documents and I got paid from doing a closing. on. A, I was in a chase lounge in uh, Riviera Maya. And I said, this is, this easy. is insane. Yeah. This is easy. Yeah. You know, and I did, you know, I... I said, how come everybody's not doing this? And I got paid more than I would have at any other brokerage. Um, you have to wait for a check. You know, it's electronic. It's done. And it's sometimes the same day. And the model is, is, is kind of revolutionary because now, like we said before, you know, you had that 95% of agents trying to learn the top 5%. That's blown wide open here because we're incentivized every which way to share. So the people that I'm, uh, I'm in business with, all my upline, who is my support, show us every there's nothing that they won't give me about how they've done their business and how they've grown you know the, the, the two big teams in california that are kind of our the top of our our upline they're going to close 700 million in 2020 all right and they did 500 million the year before so that's growth you know that's enormous Massive. growth 40 percent 40 percent and they're they're sitting to they're, they explain to us how they did everything what they did how they hire what you know it's all wide open and that's because they want EXP to thrive. They all have, they're major stockholders, sure. you know, and in my, in my position, I can get stock at every closing. I get stock when I do my first deal of the year. I get stock when people that I've brought on do their deal. So this is a huge exit plan from production, if you will, for me. Nice annuity. It's huge. And it, and it adds up quick. And this is money that no other brokerage can pay you. They don't have this can't type of, it. right. They can't afford it or they're not sharing it. Yep. The stock. Not sharing it. Yeah. So, you know, to have the stock stock price at seven or eight bucks, and now on the way here, I looked at it was seventy five, yeah, seventy six bucks. I think eighty, eighty two, yeah. something that was the high a couple yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. Um, those numbers add up, man. Growth you have thousands lie. of shares, of yep. sh- thousands of shares. You know, it adds it's, up quick. Yeah, and especially you know, you get granted stocks for free. It's the game changer. You know, in the revenue sharing, they get fifty percent of each dollar back to the agents instead of having offices, instead of having. Un- unnecessary management unnecessary management else. giving yeah. huge yeah. bonuses to them sure. the agents keep it sure and um i don't i don't see a model anywhere near it right now do you now. think we're now in an age of transparency we're getting there we're getting there you know and i see that with cryptocurrency i see that with brokerage people want transparency because there's so much shit out there to, to, to like the ppp i just explained no one knows that the banks are making making a five percent right. rip and, it, and and no one wants to be honest about it. No one wants to care. Right. They, yeah, they just give it to me. You know, so transparency is is opening people's eyes, especially to the younger people now. I'm 42 today. We're so still young, believe it or not. I, I hope yeah. so. But I mean, looking... Maybe under 43. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but looking back at, at looking to these people, 20, 25-year-old, 30-year-old, you know, and dealing with them and having ha- helping them move and getting into the financials with them, there's so much shit that they don't even care about. But they care about transparency, being open. Tell me the truth. That's it. 
and I'll and and, and they'll deal with it. You know, um, so I think things are changing that way. And you know, where I am working, where I where I do my business at EXP, the brokerage is the same way. It's like here it is. Here's the numbers. Here's where every dollar goes. Here's where every dollar goes. This is what the owner gets. This is what this is what uh, you get, and this is how it works, and this is how it could benefit you to grow your modern team. Sure. I call it a modern team. Sure. I've brought on 30 agents. They've brought on 100 agents, and you know what? You get a, you get a taste of all of it. Do you think at some point, so like in a market, obviously, again, you guys hit perfect timing. Yeah. Didn't need offices, COVID, technology, real estate, perfect storm. Do you think if the market slows down, people – Exodus, like mass mass leave EXP, or is EXP here to stay? No, we're here to stay. We definitely, for, yeah. Um, February, I'll be here two years. I think we had nine thousand agents. We now have forty one thousand or something like that, and we just keep opening new country after new country. Um, growth estimates I've seen as much as uh, two hundred thousand agents in the next two years. Two, two, five you know. times. Yeah. So even if we're half of that in two years. We're so major. Big. We're the, one of the major players. I think Keller Williams is 160. Well, you figure. So when I was doing my numbers for Reverify, there were 1.2 or 1.3 million licensed realtors in the United States. Yeah, right? something like that. Yeah, it's a big number. Be 1.5 soon. My forecast was two million. <laughs> Probably, man. Because I look at unemployment again. This is just how I look at just to kind of give people an insight into how my brain works. So, um, let's just say there's 10 million people unemployed, right? So that, it's more than that, but let's just say 10 million. Mm -hmm. You know, 20 percent of them. Someone's telling them how easy it is to be in real estate. Yeah, absolutely. So that's two million right there off the rip. So we could go from 1.3, 1.4 million as of last year to 3.3 million licensed realtors right. in America, literally before March of this year. Yeah, it could absolutely happen. They opened everything up. New Jersey did to online testing, online learning. Think about how easy that is. Now you don't have to worry about leaving your house. Oh, I can't schedule time. No, you just go online just and go online, click man. and learn. Log in and learn it, and you know, which is the way it should be. You know what? If I want to go to school from Midnight to 2 a.m. every day. Why can't I? Do you think there should be some type of production requirement to be on your own in real estate? Or do you think there should be more accountability? Or what do you think could be implemented to incentivize people? Other than money, I think money would incentivize them and obviously being successful what right. they do to maintain an active real estate license? I don't. The only reason why is because I'm more of a, like a libertarian with that. I hate putting, you know. Reaches. Yeah, demands on yeah. people. You must do this yeah. to do yeah. that. Um, if you're an agent, you're paying your dues, and you're doing zero business, that doesn't hurt me. You so you don't care I mean? if there's five people that don't know real estate that are competing with you, and maybe one or two of them gets a listing that you should have got? I believe... Personally? They won't get the business. So I believe I'll get fair. the business. That's fair. Even if their mother or their uncle is selling, something like that? Yeah, well, you know... Th you have that? You have that, right? You, you're always going to deal with that, I think, whether you do business or not. You know, I know nobody's going to get... You know, I hope nobody's going to get another family member sure. of mine's listing sure. or, or, or buy side or anything like that. Um, you know, there's agents that, for whatever reason, they're not doing business. Or there's agents that come into this with a network because of a family situation and they have, have it made. Yeah, you know what I mean? Right. Um, so be it. The competition is free market. If they're doing good work, they'll keep that business. If not, I'm going to take it. Walk through your daily routine before we close up here. We're getting a little overboard, but I how was late, of course. That's all right. Fashion will be late. Realtors are always late, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, never on time. Walk us through real quick your daily routine that helps make you successful. Obviously, more often than not, from how you do that. So um, I try to get up early and hit the gym, work out some one way or the other, um, at least five, six days a week. I've been pretty good with that for the last six months. I'm not always that good with that. But that's important to me because I realize that it gets me focused sure. for the day. And I go home. I got my kids awake. You know, they do what yeah, they do what in they the do. morning. It's chaos in the morning. Um, we get them either to their <laughs> on their computer at home or to their school, whatever's or lock happening. Lock in the closet. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> whatever's going yeah. on. And then I go to my home office and I, I, I kind of lock myself in. I'll meditate. Uh, I'll look at what I have to do. And then I prospect one way or the other. Um, used to make calls all the time. I don't do that so much anymore. I do more of a... Social media, I reach yeah. out to the, you know, I always have active leads, buyers, sellers. I'm reaching out to them and uh, setting up what needs to be set up. So usually from nine to lunch, I'm at my house doing phone calls, you know, business, real estate related business. And I get, uh, I usually take a little bit of a break for lunch. Uh, then I try to get into, I usually now have time a lot of each day for um, 
recruiting, Asian attraction. I deal with that. I, I, I have calls with that. I'm opening, I have multiple conversations going with people at different brokerages. So we're just carrying that out. So that's another aspect of my business now that I follow up on. And then usually that's an hour, hour and a half. I try to limit that unless there's appointments. And then I'm out in the field, showing houses, you know, going on listing appointments. And that's not every day, but most days I have appointments in the afternoon or into the evening. So, you know, starts early, 5.45, 6 o'clock, I'm awake. And uh, usually, uh, you know, once the family goes to sleep, I'm back at it a little bit in my office for an hour or two while it's quiet. Yeah, wind down a little bit. Yeah. I have a struggle with time management. I'm not great at it. I'm always ending up putting out fires sure. that come up. Sure, that's the business, though. Yeah. So, so as we close up each episode, we always leave the listeners with one thing to deposit that, right? What's your one thing, what's your advice to everybody out there listening, regardless of the demographic, for the new year, for 2021? Uh, this is going to be a great year in a million different ways. It's a breakout year. Last year sucked, but be grateful. You know what I mean? And, and by that is like when you practice gratitude, it always makes whatever you have enough. So appreciate what you have. Look to this year to be better because it's going to be better. And um, be present, you know, be, be present. You know, more. I'm not going to give any business advice. You know, if I, if I were going to say anything about that, it's just be yourself. You know what I mean? But the the the... The key to this year is understanding the struggles and overcoming them and being present on how to, how to deal with it, you know? Was this the best birthday party you ever had? And so far, man, absolutely. <laughs> I think you got like 500 people years. watching, you know? Like they're all, <laughs> it's they're exciting. All in. They're Thank all you guys for joining us, man. I hope you enjoyed the show. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on, obviously. Nah, I love you know, it, man. I'm glad we were able to get together in yeah. person, not wear a mask, and hopefully give people some type of value. So. I'll come here anytime, man. This is, this is exciting. Appreciate it. Yeah. You're the best. You got it, man. Thank you, Jeff.